Hey guys, it's Ben with Design3, and today I'm talking to a well-respected uh, person in the game industry, David Perry. How are you doing today, Hey, David? how are you? Can you tell us when you first started playing video games and what some of your all-time favorites are? Yeah, well, you know, way, way back, I, I the, the kind of things that really were what introduced me to it were arcade machines, and it was just the, it was the only way to really get your hands on this stuff, um, and I was playing the original Space Invaders and things like that when they came out. Battle Zone was just blew our minds. We couldn't believe what we were seeing, the missile commands and everything, Pac-Man. So arcades were, were fully going at that point. But um, the thing that was, I was in Northern Ireland at the time, so there wasn't really a game industry in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. But um, the concept of you being able to sort of take a game and put it into a computer, like type it in yourself, was strangely compelling. I actually can't explain why because it's not it doesn't sound very compelling, but you had to type the thing in and you would type it in and then you would notice some stuff when you type it in, like it would say lives equals three and you'd go, hmm, lives equals 10. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so what you're very quickly learning the structure of the games and how are they working. And I think that was, that's really what got me interested. It wasn't just a case of, well, I just played a fun game one day. It was more a little bit of both. I was playing games that I thought were great I started to see how they were getting made, and then you start going, oh, how could I make my own Pac-Man? How would that, is, is that possible? Yeah. And that's, that's what's fun. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how you got into this industry, what your first job was? So my first job was actually in high school. I, um, it's not really a job. I was, there was a magazine that, that printed um, games, because this was before you could really buy them very easily in stores. Yeah. You had to buy magazines and type them all in. So I, I, I wrote a game and I sent it to a magazine and they printed it in the magazine and I was going around school, look at me, I'm in a magazine, how cool is this? Um, but, but there was a twist to it, was um, I didn't realize I was actually being paid for that. So a check arrived in the mail for 450 pounds, uh, which is, I don't know, eight or nine hundred dollars. And when that showed up in the mail, I didn't even have a bank account. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you get paid for doing this? <laughs> so, so I started to, and you think about how much candy that buys. Yeah. So I, I, um, I started writing games just night and day. I was just putting, sending them out everywhere. And that's how I got started. Uh, throughout the course of your career, have you had like a favorite game that you've worked on? I know you've worked on quite a few good ones. So. I think my favorite game that I, I worked on would have been the last one that I programmed um, personally, which was Earthworm Jim. So um, programming the games is just so, to me, the, uh, game design is cool, but programming them and b having your, your hands in there and being responsible for the feel of it is, uh, is pretty compelling. So I, I found that when, when working on game designs that I'm not programming, you feel like you're, you're programming with broken hands, you know? Yes. It's like you're tr trying to tell everybody, can you type this or can you make that a little, and you're, you're doing it all verbally instead of just do it, fixing it yourself. And it, it's hard to let that go, to be honest. Right, right. So in uh, 2008, you started Gaikai, which is a company focusing on streaming game technology. Can you tell us kind of why you started it and what your goals for Gaikai are? Well, I'm worried about the game industry because I don't think we'll ever be the number one form of entertainment unless we do something different. We have to, we have to change. We have to, we have to, we can't just keep doing what we're doing. Um, I see Netflix icons everywhere, and I don't see a, an equivalent of all the games right beside every Netflix icon. And so games just aren't as accessible. But there's a really surprising twist with games, which is is people will pay more money for games. And then I'll give an example: is World of Warcraft's a great game, but people pay $15 a month for it. Um, now, let's choose the best movie ever made. Um, is Avatar, arguably, by the data? So, would you pay $15 a month to have Avatar? And you'd go, that's a crazy idea. I'd never pay that, not in a million years. But so somehow, the video game industry, there's this understanding that it's an, it's an ongoing relationship with a game, and therefore, you can actually get more money than you would get from a movie. But, but um, somehow that still not got us to number one in entertainment. Mm -hmm. And then you go, well, what about piracy? Well, piracy is destroying movies and music. I mean, overseas, it's just, it's, it's so rife, it's crazy. And as broadband increases and more technologies like Dropbox come along, the sharing of media is, is just gonna get easier and more trivial. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, does that, uh, is that gonna happen to the game industry too? And the answer is no. So the game industry is now connecting games to servers more than ever before. So every new game comes out, um, you're gonna see this curve of is it connected to servers? And you know, 
mark my words, in not so long, all games will be connected to servers. What does that do? Piracy goes to zero. And that's what you're seeing over in China and Korea, where movies and music are pirated a lot, but the games aren't because of the, the server connections. So if the game industry is able to extract more money and they, uh, they get pirated less, then it just becomes an access problem in my opinion. So the thing that I'm interested in doing is what can we build or do that will increase the reach of games. So um, we, will, we will be done when games are everywhere, like on every device, you know, more, I'd love to have more games available than Netflix movies. You know, every game in history should be available right there within seconds. And, uh, and then we have a really fair fight. And I think we're gonna win. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I've uh, heard some predictions that the next generation of consoles may actually be the last. Give me thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, consoles for me um, are, they stand for something which is mass market gaming. So people, they were invented to make it easy to play games. You had PCs and things before, but you could, you, you could just stick a cartridge into a piece of plastic and turn it on and a game appeared. That was fantastic. So as time goes on, um, what's really happening is they're, they, they're moving more and more into entertainment devices. Mm -hmm. So I just predict that they're going to become you know, major entertainment hubs in your house. And, and, and it will be, I'm not sure if they'll be called consoles. I think they're going to be called entertainment mm -hmm. something. I don't know if the word's been invented yeah. yet, but, but uh, it, I, I mean, it, I just expect them to want to meet all of your entertainment needs, not just you know, um, games. And you're seeing that with mobile as well. Mobile devices don't just make phone calls anymore. They do everything. So. Um, we have this desire for everything everywhere and that that's the job of of the, these media Devices is to just totally entertain me when I'm at home right, right. Um, Can you you have some interesting thoughts about inspiration versus creativity? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm a big fan of um, I, I worry because a lot of people feel like maybe they're not creative enough to be a game designer and therefore you know they should go do something else and will be a producer or something because they you know they can't do game design and, and it's not the case some of the best designers actually are producers too so I'm not just to be clear on that but <laughs> that the, I guess my point is that I think creativity some people are blessed with it that's fantastic but there's this you can also get very creative based on inspiration and I've seen this working with people in Hollywood they, they base a lot of their ideas are based upon inspiration that they've seen somewhere else. And so I've been doing tests. I, I did a test at one point with a, a room full of people and I asked them, everyone in the room would like you to create a new weapon that's never been seen before in a video game and, and you've got two minutes to go. And in general that causes people to freeze because they're like, whoa, that's really hard. Something never seen before, something completely original, that's hard. But it's actually not hard if you have inspiration. So mm -hmm. I then show a list of every possible way to die. This is in, in my book, by the way. Um, but it's just a list of every way to die. And I've, I've thought of everything I possibly can to put on that list. And as you read through the list, you'll see things like um, removing their life force. And, and you, can, you can go, hey, I could make a cool weapon out of just pulling someone's life force out of their body. Um, but the point is that there'll be you know, there's 80 other different categories that you could have chosen and one of them will resonate with you and from that you will generate an idea that is your idea to be clear. All This was inspiration. So you came up with the idea. It's your new weapon that's never been seen before. And when you do that with a room full of people, it's really fun to see the difference that inspiration um, can generate. That's great. Uh, can you give us advice that you would tell the people that want to get started in the video game industry themselves? They want to start learning how to make games? Yeah, I'm a big fan of um, don't fall in the trap of, um, I get people all the time, hey, I've, I've got this great game idea and I want to work on it, but until somebody pays me, uh, we can't, until I get like five million dollars, I can't even start, right? right. Not, nothing. And, and I'm like, that's not the way it works anymore. So the, the, the twist is, is um, you need to think about what it would take to get you, I, I love to flip it sometimes, what would make you pay for somebody's game? I imagine someone just walked in here and pitched you right now and said, you know, would you fund my game? What would it take, what would you need to see um, to, to pull your wallet out and go, I'm, I'm in, you know, say it's right. for Kickstarter or something, I'm in, that looks fantastic. Yeah. So um, that's really the challenge. And, and in the old thinking it was, well, I had to build the whole game then, and that's why I need all this money, um, but it's not really necessary. There's a belief now that if you can show what you want to make and demonstrate it in some way, then, then we know that 
engineering wise it can probably be done mm -hmm. right so in which case you really need to give a presentation of what it's going to be so this is you could do it literally with video um, the world has been trained to watch movie trailers and and in I don't know one minute decide I am going to be their opening night that thing looks freaking incredible and then you also may have decided I wouldn't be there I'm never gonna see it. it's not even <laughs> worth a rental I have no interest in that thing right we've been trained to do that so imagine you get the the video game version of that and that's your pitch if I if I see one that makes me go God, these guys are awesome this is incredible you know it's so creative and so clever you have you haven't gone and even built the, the, the engine yet but we know we can find the right engine and the right artists and everything to complete this task and so I don't, I mean, I'm not just saying this like, you know, this is something I'm just thinking about. I, I, I then, a friend of mine from, um, from Hollywood made a, a video um, of, a, of a sort of a battle sequence for, a, for what looked like a first person shooter. And I, I saw it and it blew me away. I was like, God, that looks incredible. And so I took it to the president of Atari. And, and I, I said, look, I just want to show you this video. And he looked at it, he goes, this is unbelievable. We have to get the rights to this game. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there we go. So you didn't, you, know, you didn't need to go make a whole game to make that happen, but you have to be able to demonstrate the vision that you have. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to my last question, which might be the hardest to answer. Uh, if you had to sum up video game design in just one word, what one word would you choose? I actually can't do game design in one word. There, there is the, the official answer is a challenge, so that's the actual correct okay. answer to that question. Meaning, a game a game is really just there's a challenge, and then what does it take to, to beat the challenge? But I can do it in three words, okay. which I think, and it's and, and it's something to think about. I think the DNA of good games are skill, risk, and strategy all at the same time. And and every time you're working on a game or you're thinking of a game design. If you're not hitting skill, risk, and strategy all at the same time, I would sit there and spend more time on your design. You'll usually find when the game feels a little weak, one of those three is missing. And nearly every game in history that's successful, when you go back and take a look, you'll see skill, risk, and strategy were present at the same time. And, and you can try them on the Tetrises and whatever. They all seem to fit that model. So that's something to think about. Okay, great. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you.